In this set of notes, we're going to look at monotonicity and concavity. Definition. A function f is defined on an interval i is called increasing if the function evaluated at x1 is less than the function evaluated at x2 whenever x1 is less than x2 on the interval. And it's decreasing if the function evaluated at x1 is greater than the function evaluated at x2 whenever x1 is less than x2 in the interval in i. We call the function monotonic if it's either increasing function or a decreasing function. So the question here is, what if we don't have the strict inequality? So in other words, what if we have the function evaluated at x1 is less than or equal to the function evaluated at x2? What this does is this allows for flat spots in the function. So for example, let's say we had a function that looks something like this. So notice if we were to define x1 to be here and x2 to be here, then it would be the case that f of x1 is less than f of x2. But we have to be careful because we have to be able to define this for any x1 and x2 in the interval. So if we instead had x1 here and x2 here, notice in this case f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So if we want to look over the entire interval for this function, here we would have f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x2 if we were considering, again, the interval to be anywhere that we could see here on this graph. So when we have cases like this where there are flat spots in a function, we can't say that the function is increasing. Instead, that we say that it is non-decreasing. And we could do something similar if we had a function that looks something like this. We wouldn't be able to say that the function is always decreasing. We could just say that it's not increasing. And again, that's because of that flat spot. And so it ends up that increasing functions and non-decreasing functions are very important when it comes to biostatistics and probability. And so we're actually going to revisit an example that we've seen previously in the notes. So in probability, the cumulative distribution function, or the CDF, of a random variable defines the probability that a random variable takes values less than or equal to some specified value. And so here we have an example where we're looking at the distribution of diastolic blood pressure in a population of hypertensive women using the plot below. Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure of arteries when the heart re rests between beats. This is the time when the heart fills with blood and gets oxygen. And so for reference, and again we've seen this before, we have the normal stage 1, stage 2, and when someone is in hypertensive crisis. So looking at this plot, here we have a CDF. And so just to kind of remind ourselves what the CDF tells us, for example, if we were interested in the percentage of women that had a diastolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 100, the probability that that corresponds with is approximately 0.5 or 50%. If we wanted to know the probability that a randomly selected woman would have a diastolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 80, we would see that that is approximately 10%. And so that's how we read a plot like this. And so notice what the plot is telling us is it's really telling us the probability that the diastolic blood pressure is less than or equal to some value. And so the x here, these are the values on the x-axis. And so, for example, sorry, I just realized I spelled that wrong. That should be this. So, for example, if we were, again, interested in the probability that a randomly selected woman has diastolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 100, 
we would say this is equal to 0.5 or 50 percent. So notice here what this plot really is, is it's a function where the input is diastolic blood pressure and the output is the probability. And again, you're going to see um, probabilities like this a lot in 675. Um, so don't worry too much about notation here. But the important thing to realize is we really are working with a function. And when it comes to CDFs, what we end up having is by definition a non-decreasing function. And so notice if I look at the line that the function creates, as I increase the x value that I'm interested in, the corresponding probability of being less than or equal to that value is going to continue to increase. But we are going to allow for some flat spots. And so once we get up to a certain value, we're really not going to gain any more women. And so that probability is slowly going to increase to 100%. And so we end up with a non-decreasing function. And you'll learn a lot more about CDFs when we get to 675, but do know that you are going to be working with non-decreasing functions. All right, so let's look at how we can use um, calculus to help us to figure out if we have an increasing or a decreasing function. And so what we're going to use here is what's called the first test for monotonicity. And so the test says the following. Suppose that f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, and it's differentiable on the corresponding open interval a to b. Then if the first derivative is greater than 0 for all x located in the open interval, then f is increasing on the closed interval. On the other hand, if the first derivative is less than 0 for all x within the open interval, then f is going to be decreasing on that closed interval. So let's just kind of talk through why this test works. Um, your textbooks gives a more thorough explanation, but I'm going to give kind of an intuitive explanation of why this test works. So let's consider an increasing function. And so notice this is going to be one that doesn't have any of those flat spots. So in other words, as I move my pen from left to right, I'm always going to be going upward. Okay. So this could be an example of an increasing function. So notice, if I'm going to change my pen color here, let's say that I'm interested in a tangent line at any point on this function. Notice that no matter where I draw a point and I draw the corresponding tangent line, the tangent line is always going to have a positive slope. And so this is why when we're looking at an increasing function in the first derivative, if that first derivative is strictly greater than zero, what that tells me is the corresponding tangent line has a positive slope. And we can see with an increasing function, any of those points, the corresponding tangent line will have a positive slope. On the other hand, if we wanted to look at a decreasing function, So looking at a decreasing function, notice for a decreasing function, anywhere that we draw a point, our tangent line is going to have a negative slope. And so this is why up here, if the derivative is less than zero for all x on that interval, in other words, for any x on that interval, we're going to have a negative tangent line, or the slope of the tangent line is going to be negative. This tells us that we have a decreasing function. Now let's go one step further and say what if we had a non-decreasing function. So remember a non-decreasing function looks like an increasing function, but we have some flat spots. So it could look like this. So in this section of the function, or in this flat portion, notice that the first derivative is going to be equal to zero. So why is that? Notice anywhere that I draw a point in the flat section, if I then draw the tangent line, the tangent line is just going to be a horizontal line, which has a slope equal to zero. 
So this is why in this first derivative test, notice that there's no equal sign here. We need that strict inequality for the increasing or for the decreasing, because if we allowed for that, you know, the equal to be in there, then we would be allowing for flat spaces, which increasing and decreasing functions cannot have. So let's look at a couple different examples. So we're going to determine where the function is increasing and decreasing. And so here's my function, and x is going to be an element of the real numbers. So what I'm going to use, I'm going to use that first derivative test. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the derivative of g. So here I'm going to use my power rule. So this is just going to be equal to 4x minus 1. And so we know that g of x, the function, will be increasing when the derivative is greater than zero. So what we want to do is we want to solve the inequality to find which values of x this corresponds with. So if we have 4x minus 1 greater than 0, that is the same as 4x greater than 1 or x greater than 1 fourth. And then similar, similarly, we will have that g of x will be decreasing when the first derivative is less than zero. And so again, we're going to solve that inequality and here we end up with x being less than one-fourth. So what this tells us is anywhere that x is greater than one-fourth, function is going to be increasing. Anywhere it's less than one-fourth, it's going to be decreasing. So now let's look at the graph of the function and see if that matches what we would expect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a vertical line at x is equal to 1 fourth. And notice that we do have an increasing function when x is greater than 1 fourth. And when x is less than 1 fourth, the function is decreasing. So we get exactly what we would expect. All right, let's look at another example. So again, we're going to determine where the function is increasing and where the function is decreasing. And to do this, I'm going to work with the first derivative. So notice here, looking at the function, we do have a quotient. So I automatically know I need to start by using the quotient rule. So by the quotient rule, we have that the first derivative is equal to the derivative of x with respect to 5, which is 0, times the value in the denominator, minus the derivative of x minus 2 with respect to x, which is just 1, times the numerator, divided by the denominator squared. Okay. And next, we just want to note that we're defining um, the we're only interested when x is not equal to 2, and so we're going to note here that the derivative is defined for x not equal to 2. Now, since the denominator of y prime is positive, And notice that it's always positive because we have x minus 2 squared, so that quantity always has to be positive. What that tells us, oh, and I should say positive, let me add on to this, everywhere the x is not equal to 2, and that's where we're interested in. Then we know that y prime is always negative. 
And again, that's because we know the denominator always has to be positive and the numerator is negative five. So we're always gonna end up with a negative value. So what this tells us is that y is a decreasing function. And again, let's look at the graph to see if that matches what we would expect. So notice again, we're always going to be moving from left to right when we're looking at whether or not a function is increasing or decreasing. So starting here on the left, notice that the function does decrease as we approach 2. And then as we move away from 2, we also see that that function is decreasing. So everywhere this function is decreasing. So do be careful, you know, remember that when we're thinking about the, the direction that the function is going, when we're talking about increasing or decreasing, we are looking from left to right. So that's why from left to right this way, it's decreasing, and from left to right this way, it is also decreasing. So another property that we could look at is not just whether or not the function is increasing or decreasing, but we could also look at what is called concavity. So a function is called concave up or convex if it bends upward. And so this is concave up or convex. Or if it bends downward, it's called concave down or just concave by itself. And so these are the two different um, things that we could have, again, concave up or concave down. And so a differentiable function f of x is concave up on an interval i if the first derivative is an increasing function on i, and f of x is concave down on an interval i if the first derivative f prime is a decreasing function on i. But how would we know if the derivative is increasing or decreasing? Well, the answer is we take the second derivative. So remember, we just saw that if we take the first derivative of a function, that tells us if the function is increasing or decreasing. But the first derivative itself is a function, so if we take the derivative of the first derivative, which is the second derivative, the second derivative will tell us if the first derivative is increasing or decreasing. So this gives us our second derivative test for concavity. Suppose that f is twice differentiable on an open interval i. If the second derivative is greater than zero for all x in the interval, then f is concave up. If the second derivative is less than zero for all x in the interval, then f is concave down on that interval. So why does this test work? So to see why this works, and again, your book gives a more thorough discussion of this. I'm just going to give an intuitive approach here. So to see why this works, consider a concave up function. So here we have a picture of a concave up function. Notice that if I were to look at different points along this function and I were to draw their slope. So the slope is going to start out negative and then the slope is going to turn positive. So in other words, the slope of the tangent line has to increase when we have a convex function. So since the slope of the tangent line is increasing, that means that the first derivative is an increasing function. On the other hand, if we have a concave down function, we start out with tangent lines that are positive slope and then switch over to negative slope. So in other words, the tangent line is decreasing, or we could, the slope of the tangent line, I should say, is decreasing, or we say that the first derivative is decreasing. To figure out if the first derivative is increasing or decreasing, we take the derivative of it using what we just saw in the previous part of this note set. In other words, we look at the second derivative and that will tell us if the first derivative is increasing or decreasing, which in turn tells us if the function itself is concave up or concave down. So again, let's revisit those two examples where we already looked at if they were increasing or decreasing, and now we're going to determine if they're concave up and where it's concave down.
So we already looked at this example here, and if you'll recall, we already found that the first derivative was equal to 4x minus 1 by the power rule. And then we could also look at the second derivative, which is just going to be equal to 4. Well, since the second derivative here isn't even a function of x, it's just the number 4, the number 4 is obviously greater than 0. And so if we go up to our rule here, notice that if the second derivative is strictly greater than 0, then we should have a concave up function. So let's look at our plot and see if that is the case. And so here is the plot of that function, and notice that the function is concave up. So we, we get exactly what we would expect. So let's look at the second example. And so again, recall that we already found the first derivative was equal to negative 5 over x minus 2 squared. I'm going to rewrite this as negative 5 times x minus 2 to the negative 2 power just to make it easier for me to take the second derivative. So to take the second derivative, I'm going to apply the chain rule and the power rule. So looking at the second derivative, this is going to be equal to negative 2 times negative 5 is 10 times x minus 2 to the negative 3. And then I need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function, which is x minus 2, which is just 1. So I end up with 10 times x minus 2 to the negative 3 power. So the question we need to ask is when is the second derivative greater than 0? Well, looking here, we know that the second derivative is going to be greater than 0 any time that x minus 2 is greater than 0. And the reason for that is, is x minus 2 is to the negative third power. It's to a negative odd power. And so I know that if whatever's inside the parentheses is positive, then 2 to the negative third power has to be positive. Whereas if x minus 2 is negative, when I take that value to the negative 3, that is also going to be negative. So we know again that that second derivative is going to be greater than 0 when x minus 2 is greater than 0. Or when x is greater than 2. So what this tells me is when x is greater than 2, we're going to be concave up. And then the next question we would ask is, when is the second derivative less than 0? Well, that's for the same rationale, going to be when x minus 2 is less than 0 or when x is less than 2. So when x is less than 2, we're concave down. And notice if we look at the graph, we see exactly that. In this region here, we're concave up, and in this region here, we're concave down. So as always, if you have any questions on this section, please let me know.